it's very nice, nice to be here. And as Jenny said, I'm just going to give you a high-level overview of uh, sustainability efforts here at, at Berkeley Lab. And I think you're going to get a sense. It's, it's a very easy story for me to tell that building efficiency is really central. It's a central building block uh, to our sustainability program. And I'm just going to dive in. This is actually the, the whole answer to what we're doing in one slide. And, then, um, and I'm going to go through this uh, very briefly. And then I'll spend the rest of the little bit of time we have here just touching on some different details and giving you more of a flavor here. But here's six of our key strategies that we're really pursuing right now and I think have some results to show. And then on the right-hand side are, are some metrics that indicate performance in these areas. Um, in the sustainability area, we love goals and metrics and are always, always sharing those. So I'm just going to run through these quickly. So um, one thing that we're really focusing on is excellence in facility operations. This is what you're talking about. So um, you're, um, I'm going to talk more about it, but you're also going to meet Chris Wyant, who leads our ongoing commissioning team. So we have a, a team that's continuously focused on identifying problems in our buildings, fixing them, um, and they're generating significant energy and water savings. Um, we complement that focus on operational energy savings with sort of more traditional retrofits. Um, the, the main sort of traditional retrofit we're doing is uh, LED lighting. So you know the technologies are way better. We're doing a multi-year kind of stage transition across our entire site to uh, replace obsolete lighting technology with, with, with new lighting. You know, 75 to 95 percent savings we're getting in different categories. Um, if you look over in some of these metrics, and I'll talk more about this, but we're getting significant savings. A lot of it's driven from this focus on building operations, doing better building operations. So across electricity and gas, we have a maintained portfolio of about 6.7 million kilowatt hours of savings a year, and I will talk more about that. In particular, we've been focusing a lot on natural gas savings as well, because it's kind of been behind, um, behind electricity metering. So we've had meters on gas, but not connected them to systems. So a few years ago, we sort of got those connected to online systems, and then we see all the waste, and we've been going at it. So we've actually been um, generating, we've, our, our natural gas use over the last year is 9% below uh, where it was in 2015, and we're continuing to drive that lower. And overall, um, you know, this efficiency has been driving a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and I'll talk more about this, but we have about, our, our greenhouse gas emissions are about 25% lower than they were in 2008. If I come back to the left-hand side here, another thing we focus on a lot here is new construction. So it turns out that's a, a really big part of the energy efficiency potential on our site. Um, if you just look at the site a little bit here, we're kind of a brownfield site. So we don't go out and find some open new field and build a building. In general, we're replacing an old facility with a new one. And the savings potential is immense. I'll talk a little bit more about this. But I think we're really demonstrating a next generation uh, standard for new construction. These buildings are way more energy and water efficient. Uh, they're also increasingly electrified, um, not using natural gas for space conditioning or water heating and uh, also friendly to local renewable generation. Um, another thing we focus a lot on is making all of these savings stick. So we're using new technologies, and you're going to be seeing more about this. One of those technologies is a software application called SkySpark. I think Marco will put this in perspective for you. And we also focus a lot on process to ensure that our savings are going to be around we actually use ISO 50001, which is an international energy management standard actually that the lab was involved in developing. Um, and uh, so we focus a lot on process to make sure that our savings are going to be around. This is all buildings. Buildings and building efficiency is a key part of what we do. But we also have to worry about our overall uh, environmental impact across climate, waste, and water. Um, so we also do work in transportation low-carbon commutes. Our group um, works with others here at the site that are focusing more on things like shuttles and so forth, but a main thing that we focus on is EV readiness. So um, allowing people to charge their electric vehicles here on the site. Marianne mentioned that. 
we've built up a community of EV charging over the last five years here. And we now have about 85 people that are charging their electric vehicles here regularly, um, um, sort of on a daily basis every month. We have 27 charging stations um, uh, that are supporting that. Um, I skipped one of the metrics, but I'll hit it later on. You'll see that. And then uh, a last thing that we do a lot of work on is waste. So waste diversion. We have a goal. It's actually a requirement that comes from the UC system to go to zero waste by 2020. And that means diverting uh, more than 90% of our waste from the landfill into recycling and composting. Um, so we're at about 76% waste diversion, and we're pushing further. And I'll share some more details uh, about that. Um, that we've learned from sifting around in the garbage behind our buildings. <laughs> so I'm going to dive in and so, sort of focus a little bit more on efficiency and buildings a bit here. Um, uh, I just thought it would be helpful to show this picture because really when, when uh, I think about efficiency, often I'm really thinking about greenhouse gas reductions. You know, we're thinking about the ultimate, ultimate environmental impact. So we very carefully... Uh, uh, measure and report our greenhouse gas emissions according to sort of standard protocols. And these bars represent greenhouse gas emissions from 2008 to 2018. And the different colors here are greenhouse gas emissions that come from different sources. So yellow and green here is kind of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from our buildings. Uh, this is electricity. This is gas. But we also pay attention to these transportation-related emissions. These are generally the blues here. And then other things like our release of refrigerants and HVAC equipment has a greenhouse gas impact. And those are smaller impacts, but they're, they're in here. So we have uh, a goal to reduce this over time. And, um, you know, and this is kind of a long decadal scale goal. So we're thinking about the future. Our goal is set in 2025, and we're pushing this down. And our sort of main two tools here are efficiency, reducing our loads, and then renewables, getting energy uh, that has lower environmental impact. And efficiency is kind of our preferred top choice for doing this, because we get a lot of other benefits here when we improve operation in our buildings and, and get more efficient. It really supports our mission. So generally what we're trying to do is increase the scope of our efficiency activities. And then we focus a lot on how are we going to make sure all of those savings are going to be here out in 2025 and in, in the future. And I'll keep mentioning this as I go through a few more slides. Um, here's just another view to, for you to get a little sense. So when I talk about our buildings and our building energy um, and managing our building energy efficiency, it, I think of it as a portfolio. So it's a portfolio of all the buildings here on the hill. Um, it's a portfolio for which we pay utilities. We pay about $11 million in utilities a year, so it's worth managing this. Um, this is a portfolio that produces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's actually about 50 pounds per person uh, per day <laughs> of, of CO2. Um, it, it, it's quite a bit of emissions. Um, when you look across this entire site, we have more than 100 buildings across the site, but it's about 35 key facilities uh, that account for the bulk, or about 85% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And our buildings are about 2 million square feet. So that's the, that's the portfolio and campus that we're managing here with buildings. And this just gives you a sense of it. So these are, um, on the outside ring, are all of these uh, 35 buildings I was talking about. We just numbered our buildings here. That's very exciting names. Um, and, uh, and then this is all of those remainder. This is 70 small sort of facilities in the remainder here. But you can just get a feel for it. These are different space types. And we have a lot of energy use here that's associated with one building where they have high performance computing. Um, so we have a lot of computers. Um, and we actually generate a lot of savings by improving efficiency in that area. We have a lot of labs, um, wet labs and dry labs. We have some interesting accelerator facilities. <laughs> That's part of our history here at the lab. So, um, and then we have very few buildings that you would just consider typical office buildings. Um, but all of this is being supported by typical HVAC equipment. And you sort of see savings across everything here. Um, so 
this is something that I've mentioned. It's been um, something that we've really focused on a lot in the last couple years and are seeing a lot of uh, value here. And this is this focus on ongoing commissioning in our buildings and having a team focused on this. It's, um, it's really about an approach. So, you know, in a campus like ours or like another UC campus, you have um, people with good skills to go in and, and save energy in buildings, but it's hard to be diligent enough <laughs> to do it well so that you're sure that you're really being uh, strategic and effective and persistent and know what savings you're generating. So our approach here um, involves um, a team, uh, and it, it, it has sort of five characteristic elements to it. So one is to, we've pulled a team from facilities that's really dedicated to this task. So they're not dealing with all of the work orders that are coming in uh, daily from all over the campus, hot and cold calls and so forth, but they're dedicated. We have a team that has a mix of skills um, that allows them to really solve these complicated problems in our buildings. We have HVAC technician, controls engineers, consultant, energy manager. We have a whole range of people because these buildings are quite complicated and it's, it's hard for one person to fix everything, right? And so we're sort of mixing these skills, field skills with sort of analytical skills and so forth. Um, we have a really diligent process. Um, this is the second bullet there. We have a, a repeating cycle. We call it a sprint. It's actually a four week, four to five week cycle that just keeps going where we, um, we select, we call them opportunities. It's really problems in our buildings off of a backlog. And then we decide what we're going to do for the next four to five weeks. And then we focus on fixing those things. And we have as part of the process basically a, a commissioning agent on the team that ensures that we actually did it right and they actually verify the savings that we generated there. Um, third bullet, we focus a lot on keeping this team a team. <laughs> and part of that is to check in on a daily basis just for a few minutes. Um, we usually do this virtually um, uh, here and you'll meet some of these, many of these people later, later today. Uh, just to check in and, and know what everyone's doing and what barriers people are finding and so that we can remove those barriers. We build into this process um, regular feedback so that we continually get better at what we're doing. Um, so we kind of do this in two ways. One is at the end of the, our four-week cycle, we get everyone together and we say, well, what do we really do this month? <laughs> what went well? What didn't go well? How could we make things a little bit better? And we choose one thing to do better, and we put that in the hopper for the, the next sprint. Um, we also, at the end of that four-week period, we're looking at the savings that we generated in that last four weeks. And we're looking at it within the context of all of the savings we've generated. For us, that's about in the last year and a half or so. And so we're starting to get a really good feel of how this detailed work in the field, which you know a lot about, um, sort of maps up to our big higher level goals. And we're getting better and better at choosing things in the field that have a lot of impact on uh, reducing our energy use, but also improving operations. Um, and then, again, I just keep harping on it, we, we sort of focus a lot on tools and process to make sure that these savings are still around. So this is, um, this is a depiction of this portfolio of maintained energy savings that I've talked about. And this is work that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, I have them categorized here in different ways. It's not that important. But these are a whole bunch of different measures and projects that are adding up in this waterfall chart to this total of 6.7 million kilowatt hours. Um, and I'll just say generally that um, some of these are kind of traditional retrofit projects, but where we're getting the big savings is in focusing on operations, and it's focusing on operations over in our computing center. So we've reduced the energy uh, that we need for cooling uh, in that center by about 40% over the last two years, just by making it run better. <laughs> and we haven't done any big capital projects. We've just gotten a whole bunch of smart people, really, together and focused on optimizing that system. And then all of this work that we're doing in buildings across the site to make the buildings operate better um, is, is adding up to a significant amount. 
Um, you know, this amount of energy, this is electricity and gas savings. Um, you know, it's 6.7 million kilowatt hours. Sounds like a big number. It, it's pretty big. <laughs> um, it's about the energy that would, you could generate from a 4.3 megawatt solar array. That's about 17 acres of solar, which we don't have space for up, up on this hill. Um, we also like to talk about it here. We have a, a cyclotron facility. It's called the 88 inch cyclotron facility. And it's about one and a half times the amount that that cyclotron facility uses. So it's adding up. And we are maintaining these savings and continuing to add up. As I said, it's, it's a 9% reduction in natural gas use. It's a few percent reduction in our total energy use um, as we go. And there's also cost savings. We actually have really low electricity rates here. Um, so um, using outside prices, this would be over a million dollars of savings, and, and this will continue to grow. Um, this is, um, just ignore this for a second. So <laughs> you're going to get more of a feel of this kind of stuff from Marco. But one thing I wanted to say is that we have done a lot of work behind the scenes to enable some of, some of this work. And generally, one thing that we've done is we've sort of move from a world um, in which we think of building, building energy and building energy performance data as a whole bunch of different siloed building automation systems, which is what we've built up on this campus over the last uh, 20, 30 years, to really just thinking about it as a whole bunch of data. And we've sort of worked to uh, integrate to a whole bunch of different data sources. These are meter data sources. This is all of the sensor and actuator data in our building automation system and weather data and so forth. And just to integrate to all of that data, focus on um, having robust interfaces to that data that often go around our building automation systems, focusing on cleaning up that data, um, focusing upstream on getting those meters to actually be showing the right things, which is a hard job, um, and then tagging it all in a consistent way. Um, so, and then we put it in a system like SkySpark. Um, so when I say tagging it all in, in, a, in a consistent way, that allows us to really scale our energy management activities um, because, you know, in the sort of older world, you would have, you'd look at like an air handler in a building and you'd just go and you'd look at the data coming off of that air handler. In this newer world, we, um, we sort of say, well, what do we want to know about our air handlers? And then we look at all the air handlers across our campus because we've tagged all the data so that we can just query you know, the supplier temperature for every air handler if we want. And so it really allows us to scale our energy management activities. Um, and so we're sort of building up this data infrastructure to support all of this. Um, and then, I, and I will do this one quickly, we're, we're focusing a lot on this, what, what is the process? Um, to make sure that these energy savings stay. Um, as I said, we're using ISO 50001, the standard. And I guess the main thing to get out of it is that um, while we focus on having a robust technical process to do savings, we're also focusing on all of the institutional stuff <laughs> that you need to do to make sure the savings are going to be here. Do you have management support? Do people have the right training? Are the documents being controlled in a way that they're going to be here three years from now. All that stuff that prevents savings from being around in an organization, you know, five years, everything gets lost. You know, you, so, so we're focusing a lot on that process. Um, all right. Uh, so this is a little bit about new construction. The main thing to say here is um, we, we really try to take this opportunity um, to uh, find savings in new construction. And we have a 80,000 square foot lab that's under construction right now, um, right here in the center of campus. It's replacing a facility that's out in Walnut Creek right now. So this is one of these opportunities. Um, one thing we do in this approach is we set an overall whole building performance target for the new construction. And we actually do modeling through the process uh, to, uh, and we ask our design team to say, what do you really think, the, how much energy is this building going to use in operation? Um, which is a harder question to answer than, you know, what are the code modeling results? And so what we did actually for this one facility is we, 
looked at the baseline, which is what the facility actually uses now that we're going to replace. And then we set a design target that was half of that. And we set a stretch target that was 35% of that baseline. And the building is actually coming in at about 30%, so 70% savings. Um, and we're going to be sort of keenly looking as we occupy that building to operate it at this level. Um, and so this approach just allows you to sort of pull a whole bunch of design activities and get the architects and the engineers really integrating and working to be able to generate this type of energy savings um, um, relatively cheaply because they're doing it very early in the process and not thinking of it as an add-on there. All right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Sounds like one of those planted questions. Yep. Um, we're seeing pretty drastic improvements in comfort. And because um, uh, the buildings are really operating poorly. And so actually one of the interesting things we're doing in SkySpark is we're, we're really starting to build up more reports and heat maps and so forth that just demonstrate that comfort. Um, and they're much better than that sort of traditional view in a building automation system of the temperatures on a floor plan. You know, we're looking at sort of meeting temperature set points over time and so, so forth. And um, that's a big selling point for the, our customers, which are the people that are in the building. So really significant improvements, um, absolutely. Um, I'm going to skip the, to the trash quickly because it's kind of interesting. <laughs> um, one thing just to say about water savings is we don't have tons of grass here um, that we water. Um, and so a lot of our water savings has to do with um, uh, making sure we operate cooling towers well. It's also uh, about making sure we don't have leaks. So in a sort of aging facility, a lot of our water savings, while we do things like uh, do uh, restroom fixture replacements, the challenge there is actually having a good process to identify times when a cooling tower might not be working and, um, and our maintenance department might be tempted to use one, once through city water to cool a building for a while because that uses up a lot of water. And so actually these big jumps and humps in our water use over time actually stem from these operational issues and we're finding that we can get at those with kind of this ongoing commissioning diligent approach and that's a really big key to, to uh, savings. Um, this is the last bit because we need a, a little bit of time for, for questions here. Um, you know, I, I work across energy, water, and, and waste. And you kind of think of it sometimes like, you know, water is like 20 years behind energy. You know, they, so like in some places in California, you know, they're just starting to meter the water, right? <laughs> There's a lot of waste that's happening in water. There's a lot of waste that happens in, in energy. You know that. But it's actually, you know, things are relatively sophisticated. And we also know that there's a lot of room for improvement. Water's that way. And then trash is like at the bottom. <laughs> so one thing we've tried to do is uh, get some data on what's going on. So um, what we've done is we uh, have a student come <laughs> and they sift through all of the garbage that comes out of each of our buildings. And we're trying to get some insight into how to meet our zero waste goal, goal overall. So they. Um, uh, well, the bins are out there, but there's basically three streams. There's uh, recycling, compost, and trash. And they look in each of those bins, and they weigh everything. And they say, well, which, what, what compost was, uh, how much weight of, of compost was actually put in the compost bin? That's sort of this green piece here. So that was, was diverted successfully. How much recycling got in the recycling bin? And that's this blue bar. And then we measure separately how much stuff got in the wrong bin. And what we find is that actually people here are excellent in recycling and composting, um, but they're terrible because in, in putting a whole bunch of recycling and compost in the trash. So we have like 2% contamination in our recycling and compost bins, and we have like 75% contamination in the landfill bin because there's 
compost and recycling in there. So that's this, um, this uh, purple stuff here. And then the gray is actually what was successfully put in the landfill bin. So we've learned a lot from this. This is each one of our buildings. What's the one on building 54? Um, it's the cafeteria. So we're actually quite good um, because there's a lot of food waste of getting that into the compost. And so what we actually see here is that technically it's feasible to do 90% waste diversion really across all of our facilities. Like if you add up the compost, the recycling, and the, the stuff that could have been diverted but wasn't done correctly, it's over 90% throughout. And then you see this huge range in performance across of our, our buildings. And so we're starting to use this data because we find people um, that are passionate about this in this building and they're, they, they're, they're concerned about where they are in this graph. And so we're working with them and we have a lot of detail from these audits and, John, and we can really drive this. Yeah. So when you have lunch here, lunch is at noon, it's just back here. There's no trash cans back here. Because the cans are right outside the door. And we have these candy, they're right above the bin, including compost, other recycling, and landfill. And, and I will be here at lunch if you want to just ask. We should all just talk about it. Which, where should this go? Instead of like feeling nervous when you're saying it has been. Um, yes. Uh, it's available on our website, and we're just starting to sort of engage with uh, advocates in the buildings and sending it out. So right now we're not sort of sending it to, to individuals very, very often, but we will. It is, yeah. So all of this data is public. If you go to our sbl.lbl.gov, Sustainable Berkeley Lab, uh, there's a data page, and it's all there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. What falls into your category of non-recoverable contaminants? Uh, oh, it just means something that couldn't be recycled or composted. So a, a real piece of trash, uh, you know, like a, um, a, a potato chip bag. It's a light piece of trash, but that got put in the compost. So that was a contaminant in the compost, and it, it's actually something that can't be diverted. It should go in the landfill. Just a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, I think you have one question there. Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned early on that you had uh, a big conversion to LED uh, lighting throughout the campus. Are you getting any pushback from faculty or other people about the blue lights and all that, in that business? We haven't gotten, we have on our we haven't gotten pushback yet. Uh, we've been focusing, we've been doing most of our work in exterior, and we're moving into sort of high traffic non-personal spaces, so hallways, bathrooms, stairwells, and so forth. So we haven't done tons of work in people's personal workspace. So we haven't, but we may <laughs> as we go on. We've also been very careful, you know, and have been following the sort of use of uh, high color temperatures on exterior lighting, and we, we use... Um, pretty warm lighting out there um, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Well, uh, organizationally, you have your separate uh, cross-disciplinary team working on saving. How does that team interact with the operation side? How does it keep them informed as to what you're doing, where you're doing it, how it's going to affect their work, i.e. probably improve their <coughs> Yeah, the way we've done it is they actually are in operations. So uh, my organization is not within facilities, but we have elected to uh, keep this, this team is mostly facilities staff. And so they're in facilities, and that way we make sure that we're coordinating fully. And what we've done is sort of we've worked out to sort of make these people dedicated to this task, but they're still within the facilities organization.
Um, the overwhelming experience on this team, um, which is uh, HVAC techs, uh, people in the field, controls techs, is that um, I think they're overjoyed to be working on this. <laughs> because um, the day, like when you try to solve these really complicated problems in buildings, or even when you get a hot and cold call, you have to go and you go through a process, and often that's being caused by a big complicated problem in the control system. And you don't really have the tools at your disposal to fix the problem. So, you know, you go do something, you put something in hand, <laughs> you, do, you do whatever you need to do, and, and uh, you close the work ticket. And you run into a lot of barriers, and it's not very satisfying. But on this team, when you have all these people working together, and you see what the savings are at the end of every four-week period, and you talk about what successes you've had that month, People are just like, this is awesome. <laughs> I mean, people are really happy because they're being made much more effective. And I think we're using the skills that they actually have. And, and people are getting way better at doing things. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing tasks now that would take us, you know, roughly two days to sort of get our head in, figure out how to do something and fix it. And now people can do it in, in literally like five minutes. <laughs> because they're continuously dedicated and they get better and better at what they're doing. Um, it's really different from that sort of work ticket model where you sort of are always kind of scattered, I think. So, yeah. Do you have any metered facilities that have gone largely LED? And the reason I ask is I'm curious as to whether there's any, if, if you've noticed any power factor effect from LED lights. Um, I have not noticed power effect, power factor effects. So yeah, that's not that something. Old school, but with LED light, you get a free, funky good looking sine wave. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good point. No, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't perceived that, but I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've kicked myself out of the slide deck here, but. Um, uh, Really, uh, feel free to contact me. My contact information is at the end. Um, and I will be around during lunch, too. I'm going to sit and look at the presentations here, too, because they all look so interesting. Um, so uh, I'm mm -hmm. happy to talk further. Um, thanks. Thanks.